بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على مولانا محمد وعلى آله في كل لمحة ونفس عدد ما وسيعه علم الله يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تؤاخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم We finished the negative attributes and often uh, in conjunction with the negative attributes the theologians talk about cause and effect and they talk about free will, and the issue of good and evil. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, with your permission, I would like to postpone that so that we can talk about the positive attributes and we can talk about their opposites and then what is ja is, and then talk about that then. Um, so we'll try to conclude with that, the conclude the discussion about divinity with that, the idhnillahi ta'ala. Tonight we want to look at verse 8 and 9. So he says here, وَقُدْرَةٌ إِرَادَةٌ ثُمَّ الْحَيَاةِ وَالْعِلْمُ وَالْدَّلِيلُ خَلْقُ الْكَائِنَاتِ وَالسَّمْعُهُ وَالْبَصَرُ الْكَلَامُ دَلِيلُهَا نَقَلَهُ الْأَعْلَامُ So he now gives us the positive attributes which are also called the ma'ani, the substantive attribute, the substantive realities. And he says, power, will, furthermore, life and knowledge. Proof of these attributes is the creation of existent things. Verse 9, God's hearing, sight, and uncreated speech, their proof, the learned have passed down to us. So in these two verses, he has given us the seven substantive attributes, the seven positive attributes of God. Uh, to emphasize what we've said before, God's attributes are infinite. But these 13 that we focus on in theology are regarded to be absolutely essential to the proper understanding of divinity. And therefore, the other vast issues that pertain to divinity, that can come later. But if we were to speak of God and not understand these 13, then there would be deficiency in that. So we have, again, the first attribute, which is ontological, self-attribute, which is necessary existence. It is affirmative, and it affirms the existence of the essence, but it makes no reference to any other substantive attribute. Then we have six negative attributes, and they're called that way because they're not substantive. In other words, they're not about qualities that God actually has. They're about qualities that he does not have. So we have pre-existence, meaning no beginning. And we have everlastingness, meaning no end. And we have dissimilarity, meaning no likeness between God and the created world. And we have self-sufficiency, meaning no need, that God has utterly no need. All that he wills to create is easy for him. He simply says, be and it is. 
he doesn't need instruments, he doesn't have difficulties, and so forth. And then we have oneness, which is the negation of any duality, any plurality, any parts, any composition, anything like that which pertains to the essence of God in itself and that also pertains to other beings in creation. So none of them share his divinity. None of them have an essence like his. None of them have attributes like his. Those are the negative attributes and they are extremely important. And they are fundamental in delimiting our understanding of God so that it is on a sound foundation and so that it can grow in a healthy way ta'ala. Now as we go into the seven basic substantive attributes all of them will be measured against the negative attributes and all of them are corollaries or logical consequences of necessary existence. So here he has broken the seven substantive attributes into two groups. The first one is life, knowledge, will and power. He puts them in a different order for poetic reasons. But ordinarily they're spoke of, spoken of in the order of life, knowledge, will and power. He says power, will, knowledge, uh, power, will, life and knowledge. This is for poetic reasons. But then he says proof of these attributes is the creation of existent things. He means by that that many of our scholars believed that any human being of sound nature, and human beings are created with sound natures and with the power of intellect, the ability to think properly, the ability to use reason. And we, the moderns, often are very deficient in that. This is one of the strange things about our age, as we've said many times, that pure reason has atrophied because of the fact that for the last 200 years in the West, the focus has been totally on empirical knowledge, totally on what is known through the eyes, ears, touch, taste, and smell. And that is the lowest order of knowledge. And it is also the least definitive form of knowledge. It is the most conjectural form of knowledge. And um, that's very, very important. But so today, especially when we teach Apida, it's very important for us to also focus on training pure reason, training the intellect, so that we can again become familiar with the way that pure reason works. We may be very familiar with that in mathematics, which is all pure reason. We may be very familiar with that in algebra or geometry or trigonometry or things like that, or computer sciences and binary and things like that. That's all pure reason. But we're not used to that when it comes to things like indicating from the nature of changing bodies that the world is temporal, that its origin is nothingness. And that is as definitive as one plus one is two. So we have to be trained in that. But those people who have sound intellect and who have a sound nature, they should be able to look at creation and they should be able to see that creation must have a Lord and that that Lord uh, must have the attributes of life. He must be a living God and he must have the attribute of knowledge and will and power. 
Then he says in the second verse, وَسَمْعُهُ وَالْبَصَرُ الْكَلَامُ دَلِيلُهَا نَقَلَهُ الْأَعْلَامُ He says God's hearing, sight, and uncreated speech, their proof, or their proof, the learned have passed down to us. What he means by that is that many scholars believe that these three attributes of hearing, seeing, and speech, these are essentially based in prophetic revelation. And they believe that because of the fact that God's knowledge is sufficient, God's will is sufficient, God's power is sufficient. So therefore, um, the adding on of these qualities of hearing and seeing and speech, that might not be something that people would readily know. It might not be something that they could actually be expected to deduce, even though they are manifestations of the perfection of the One. So we want now to talk about these seven attributes. But, um, okay, so we will talk about them in the order of life, knowledge, will, and power. Life is regarded to be the most fundamental of these because for knowledge to be meaningful, and for will, which is choice and freedom in the divinity, to be meaningful, then there must be life. And the same for power. So we affirm then that God is a personal God. God is a living God. And as we said before, in talking about dissimilarity, uh, He is not a force. He is not um, energy. He is not a, a nature. He is not any kind of impersonal or inanimate reality. Um, he is not a pattern that is in creation, which we could call a way or a sunnah of God or something like that. That God is a living God. When we talk about the positive attributes, we also talk about how they relate to creation. Because the seven positive attributes are essentially creation related. And God has infinite realities and infinite attributes that are not related to creation because God is perfect in and of himself, and he is infinite in and of himself. Even without creation, and creation is made in space and time, God is absolutely perfect. So he has other attributes that we do not know or understand by virtue of the fact that we are people who are rooted in creation. And we only know the realm of possible being and the contingency, the dependence of possible being on necessary being. So this is what we can talk about. This is what we understand. That's why we know Allah in terms of his 99 names. And all of these 99 special names, 100 less 1, are names of creation. They're names of the Creator. And they are manifest in the creation around us. So we will talk about relations. We will say, for example, that knowledge is cosmically related to all things known. Will is cosmically related to all things willed. Power is cosmically related to all things that God creates. And we'll talk about that in detail. But we say that life does not have a necessary cosmic relation. And what we mean by that, that the existence of God as a living God, who has eternal life, does not necessitate that he create living things, 
or that life be a quality of the universe. Okay, that doesn't necessarily follow. But life is that attribute that God has which is essential to the validity of his having knowledge, will, and power. That being said, yes. Right, so if I say that God has power, then that implies that there are things over which he has power. So it implies the existence of something outside of his power. If I say that God has knowledge, then it implies that there are things that exist or will exist that he knows. And we'll talk about that in detail. But when we say life, then it does not necessarily imply that. This is what our theologians reason. However, this brings up an interesting question, and that is the nature of the created world. And this is a question that is not usually talked about in um, theology, but it's a very interesting question. That is this creation alive or not? And um, is it inanimate and animate or not? It's typical of human beings, of course, as we all do, to divide the world into the animate and the inanimate, into the living and the non-living. And we don't make this an issue of theology. Okay, this is regarded to be a peripheral matter, which pertains to sound belief, but it is not required belief. And therefore, if you are comfortable, and only comfortable, with the obvious dichotomy in the world between the animate and the inanimate, then stay with that. There's no problem. But many of our scholars prefer not to use that cognitive frame. Again, cognitive frames are very important. And cognitive frames, as you know, are these understandings, these um, frames of understanding that we put on the world, and they affect the way that we see the world. And it's very important to have exact cognitive frames. We'll see, for example, when we talk about cause and effect, that we have this amazing word, sebeb. And we use the word sebeb for what an ordinary person would call a cause. But when we look at the word sebeb, we will see that it is a very precise word because it only in indicates the linkage between A and B. It does not indicate that A actually causes B. So it's a very powerful cos uh, cognitive frame. And we'll talk about that later, okay? All right? But um, the accurate cognitive frame to speak about this world that many of our scholars have is that it's not divided between living and dead, but it is divided between samit and natik. It is divided between that which is silent and does not speak, like the pillar, and that which is not it, like you, or like the bird, or like the whale in the sea, or the angels, or the spirits, okay? And that is a very careful description of reality, because whether, you know, we do not doubt that this tight table does not have organic life. Okay, it doesn't grow, it doesn't reproduce, uh, you know, it doesn't move on its own, it doesn't have children, okay, so it is not organically alive. That we could agree on, there's not a problem with that. But is it actually 
dead in the sense that it has no perception and it has no relation to anything outside of itself, uh, that's a question that you and I really can't say. We don't have access to that. And especially in the light of revelation, we know from the Qur'an and we know from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that everything in existence glorifies its Lord. Everything in the existence, yusabbihu bihamdihi. Some people say that's a metaphor, that the, the, the stone doesn't actually glorify God. That's just a metaphor because the stone in order to exist in the realm of possible being, it points always to necessary being that willed it to be. The atom cannot account for itself. The atom points always to its creator, just like the watch points to its maker. All things are like that in the realm of possible being. But many of our scholars take this literally, that everything in the heavens and the earth glorifies God. And this is what I believe, that everything in the universe is alive. It's like, is there life in outer space? There's only life in outer space. There's only life here. And some scholars say this is by virtue also of the fact that God himself is a living God. So therefore, when he creates, he imp imparts the gift of life in different ways to everything. And again, when we look at the atom that we've talked about many times, this is absolutely beyond imagination, that this is an incredible thing. You know, the electron going around the nucleus 10 billion times in one millionth of a second. How can it exist? How can it continue to exist? We cannot take these things for granted. And in its reality, it's tasbih. It is the glorification of God. It is the praise of God. It declares the greatness of God. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbaru Kabira. So that is a very, I believe, sound way of looking at creation. And the cognitive frame that we use for that is to divide reality between the speaking and the not speaking, not between the living and the dead. And again, that is honest. I know this table doesn't speak. Never spoke to me. Okay, I know that your chair doesn't speak. It never spoke to me. But does it have any kind of life or consciousness that is unique to it, which is not organic? I don't know that. This is something that could only be known by remarkable experience, like the rocks that gave salams to the Prophet in Mecca, before his prophecy. And he would say, this is the rock who gave me salam. And he stood on the mimbar in Medina, right, which was made of a date palm. And this was his mimbar. And authentic traditions tell us that when the carpenter came, the carpenter boy, and he made the mimbar for the Prophet. And the Prophet didn't stand on the old mimbar that was made from the date palm, that it began to weep like a baby. And the Prophet came down from the mimbar and he embraced it. And then he asked it what it would like. And he gave it the choice of different things, and among them if it would be in the garden with him, and it accepted that. And then it didn't weep. Okay? Is this irrational? Absolutely not. Is this extraordinary? Yes, it's miraculous. And this is why also we have to know the possibility of the possible. That the realm of the possible is an infinite realm. And God does in that whatever he wills. He does in that whatever he wills. This is again why when we speak about experience and empirical reason, we speak about adah, which is customary experience. 
implying by that cognitive frame that there is also experience which is not customary, like miracles. And miracles are true. And we have miracles in the lives of the messengers and the prophets, and we have miracles in the lives of saints. And you can see them in your life right now. And maybe you have seen them in your life. You know, Allah does amazing things. That's not customary. I remember when I made pilgrimage from Egypt. That was my first pilgrimage in 1973, December of 1973. It was December 1973, January 1974. Um, you know, I was a student here. I went to make pilgrimage. And I lived in Zamalek. And there was a little mosque in Zamalik where I would pray. And the imam was a very simple man. And it was a little tiny mosque and he was a shopkeeper. And so I go to Mecca. It was an incredible experience. Absolutely. In fact, I saw the haram even before I got there in dreams. The whole thing. And I'm just walking like in a daze. And I went to the second floor of the haram so I could watch the Kaaba. I just couldn't take my eyes off. And watch the people come in, the Senegalese, the Turks, the Caucasians from Central Asia, and every race on the face of the earth. I couldn't go to sleep all night. And then in the morning after subh and after sunrise, I turned around and who is sitting behind me? It's the Imam from Zamanik. He didn't know I was making pilgrimage. I didn't know he was making pilgrimage. But he ends up right there behind me. Did that happen by random? I mean, that's, it's a chance. I didn't intend it. He didn't intend it. But Allah does things like that. Right? And it's to make you strong in your faith. It was beautiful. We embraced each other. We were happy. We had breakfast together. And so forth. Right? So Allah does in the realm of possible being whatever He wills. And for you to see miracles, you have to get the tartib rabbani. You have to get the proper ordering of the self, which is living by the Sharia, living with the Aqidah, and then you, you will see amazing things. You do see amazing things. So, you know, the world is alive. Everything in it is alive. The atom is alive. You know, the uh, molecules are alive. Fire is alive. All of these things glorify God. And all of them are the servants of God. We are the only problem. We are the problematic one. Because we are given the gift to obey or disobey. And the jinn who are our counterparts, they're also like that. They have this ability to obey or disobey. Um... So then we take the attribute of life, ilm, and we say that God's life and his knowledge, like all of his attributes, are functions of necessary being. So therefore they are utterly like anything that you and I know or can imagine. You are living, you're alive, but you live by the ruh. And your ruh is created. And Allah's existence and his life is absolutely perfect. He creates the ruh and he can breathe the ruh. The ruh that he creates into Adam. But God's life is not a life that is an analogical to the life of created things. And it is pre-existent. First negative attribute. No beginning. It is everlasting. It never ends. And it never changes. It never gets greater. It never gets less. It doesn't become more intense. You do. The disbeliever who does not know God is dead, even though organically alive. Our revelation refers to them that way. The living are those who believe, who know God. Those who live in this life and do not discover that truth, they are not among the living. Okay? Even though they're alive and they have rights, and there are brothers and sisters and we serve them, 
and we, and, and we help them. But you're not alive until you believe. And our life becomes more and more intense. And the more that the believer purifies himself or herself, the more that the believer imbibes this beautiful knowledge and knows it. And it's the basis of our dhikr and our fikr and the way we live. And we are filled with the ecstasy of that. We become alive, living people. So our life, it changes. It becomes more intense. It becomes more real. It becomes more beautiful. You know, but the life of God is perfect, full, complete in every way. It is dissimilar, not like the life of any living thing, organic or inorganic. Look at the viruses. We've talked about viruses. You know, viruses have different shapes, like they have three basic shapes that I know of in my ignorance. You know, some of like little staffs, for example. And that virus, is it organically alive or not? It appears that it's not. It doesn't have any signs of organic life, but again, we know that it is alive. It does do tasbih. It does glorify God. And the role that it plays is a role which is a test to us. But the virus comes into the body of the organic animal, like us, and it's not organically alive, and it finds its way to a cell, and it finds the door to the cell, because cells have openings, they have doors, and it goes in. It's like it's got a master key to get in. And then what does it do? It goes to the DNA that is there in the cell, and it reprograms the computer. DNA is the most marvelous computer. My father, may Allah have mercy upon him, uh, he was a great scientist. He had a PhD in anatomy and veterinary medicine, and he had a second PhD in organic chemistry. And he studied DNA. And when DNA was discovered in the 1960s, he came to me immediately and brought me the Scientific American that told about the discovery. He had me read it, and he showed me the molecule. I mean, to him, this was incredible. And my father used to say, I cannot look in the electron microscope and not believe in God. That's what he would say. He believed in God. He believed in one God. In fact, when I became a Christian, I was a Christian, and when I took the catechism, and I knew all the catechism, one of the main steps in my journey to Islam is one beautiful spring day when I was 12 years old and I leave the church with my father, you know, and we're walking hand in hand, and then he said to me, Larry, he said, Larry, he said, do you really believe in the Trinity? You know, and to me it was just like, <laughs> slap. It's like, what? I mean, you, my father, asked me this question, and I was like, like do you not believe in the Trinity? Because like my father, I, I admired him greatly. And he said, you really believe in the Trinity? And I didn't know what to say. I couldn't speak. And then he told me a story, which was probably a made-up story, about a Chinese sage and a missionary. And the missionary is trying to convince the sage that God was one, but he's also three. And the sage said, but one is the absence of plurality, Three is the beginning of plurality. These are contradictions. How can they be the same? And for me, that was the end of the Trinity, just like that. Because my father didn't believe it, it's like, I can't either. In fact, the same week, I went back to my pastor who wanted be, me to be the next Martin Luther. And I went to him, I told him I have doubts about the Trinity. And he was shaken. He was shaken because I didn't last for one week. I was 12 years old. And he has the same doubts, you can be sure of that. Because many Christians don't accept the Trinity. This is the luggage which is very difficult for them to, you know, to, the baggage, very difficult for them to keep. But my father would say, I cannot look in the microscope, you know, and not believe in God. And why is that? And what my father would say is he said, take 10 coins, okay, take 10 marbles, Okay, and uh, number them one to ten. 
and put them in your pocket and mix them up. And he said, draw number one from your pocket first. What's the probability? One to ten. And then he said, okay, put it back to make it easy, you know, and mix them up. He said, now after you drew number one first, draw number two second. What's the probability? Ten times ten. So it's one to a hundred. You can do that. You could get one and two, and then put two back and mix them and draw number three third in order. One, two, three. One to a thousand. And now put that back and draw number four fourth. What's the probability? One to ten thousand. And what is the probability that you could draw from your pocket in order, always putting the marble you drew back in the pocket and mixing it, that you could get one first, two second, three third, four fourth, fifth, five fifth, six sixth, and so forth, and ten tenth. One to ten billion. Meaning that if you are to draw a marble from your pocket every second, and every time you make a mistake, you just start all over again, you might be able to get the series one through ten one time in 325 years. So you have to do it, your son has to do it, your grandson has to do it, your great-grandson has to do it, your great-grandson has to do it. This is all you do. You're the marble drawer all your life. Don't sleep 24-7. Okay, so what does that show us? That's very important that random does not exist, and it cannot exist. So my father means to say the DNA molecule, which he and my father used computers, you know, this is when computers were still very elementary. They were big things. And you have to know computer languages, and you get all these printouts, and you have to know how to work it. But my father said that the DNA molecule, compared to the most advanced computers we have, you know, he said it makes the computer look like a child's toy. This cannot be by chance. Absolutely impossible. It cannot be by chance. And all organic living things that we know in this world, they have, even viruses, because viruses have the DNA code. code. They just don't have recognizable organic life. But they will take your code, and then they make the cells of your body produce that DNA. Okay, that's the way cancer works. May Allah protect us from that. And, and other viruses. So these things cannot be by chance. Okay, they cannot be. That's why my father said, I cannot look in the microscope and not believe in God. Okay, that's the truth. That's an intellect. That is an intellect that's alive. And again, you go back to the, the marbles in the pocket. Was that actually chance? You know, here, the random that we study in the pocket, you know, is in a thimble. You know, it's not real chance. It's not real random. Because I have a hand that draws the marble. Some human being made the marbles. They didn't make themselves. Some human being numbered the marbles. We have a pocket to put them in. So the only thing that is happening here is that I am unable to select what I draw. But I'm able to draw it, to look at it, to put it back. That's not random. So here you see that random as a cosmic reality, it cannot exist. It does not exist. And, you know, pulling your marbles out of your pocket in a series of one to ten is the simplest order that you can imagine. The only order that you could imagine that would be more simple than that would be one that's shorter. Okay? These created things are all ordered. You have this on top, then you have this, 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 
they're in order. But they are also composed. They're also put together. And they are put together often of disparate things, of different things. Okay, like the watch, made up of so many different parts. The possibility that this could just happen? Impossible, right? Totally impossible. And again, this is why, as, as Paul Tillich says, who is a great German Christian theologian, that the disbeliever is a person who does not take reality seriously. It is a person who does not look at this world around us. This world cannot be by chance. The finite cannot account for itself. The finite always points to the infinite. The possible points to the necessary. Yes. Paul Tillich, which is T-I-L-L-I-C-H. Tillich. Tillich. Okay, it looks like Tillich, but it's not. It's Tillich. Okay, T-I-L-L-I-C-H. And, um, you know, so... Um, God's knowledge then, this is one of the great attributes of God. And the nature of God's knowledge is that it yekshif min reidi chafa. It manifests without anything being hidden. Okay, so the nature of knowledge is that it makes manifest that which is known. Although when I say that it makes manifest in English or in Arabic, yekshif, that would imply that there was a time when it was not makshuf. That would imply that there was a time when it was not manifest. And that's not true of God's knowledge. So we say, yekshifu min ghayri khafa sadiq. You know, it manifests God's knowledge without there being any prior obscurity or hiddenness. And what does God's knowledge manifest? So again, we are talking about necessary being. We are talking about God, creator of the heavens and the earth. Not talking about you. You know, as Ibn Atah Allah says, Ilahi ana jahilun fi ilmi. Fakayfa la akunu jahulun fi jahli. I am ignorant in my knowledge. I am ignorant in my knowledge. Whatever I know, what I do not is. No, is infinitely greater. I am ignorant of my knowledge. How can I not be totally ignorant in my ignorance? That's you and me, if we're honest, right? God gave us the gift of knowledge, but I only know surfaces. I know very little. I know probabilities. God knows everything. And he knows it absolutely and utterly. And this is a right of his divinity. And this is his description. And this is why he is al-ma'bud bi-haq. This is why he is the one who is worshipped by right. Okay? And this is why to attach yourself to him and to draw near to him is the most beautiful thing there is. The gardens that he creates of eternity are vaster than the heavens and the earth. The garden is vaster than the heavens and the earth. You know, and it is not comparable to the beauty of God. And the beauty of being in the garden is nothing like the ecstasy of knowing God and witnessing God. Nothing like it. The Lord of the garden is infinitely greater. And that's why those men and women who devote themselves to God alone and who worship God for God, they are the most intelligent of all. And in fact, they are the most blessed of all and the most endowed because they have pleasures that are beyond what any eye could see or ear could hear, even the people of the garden, and they are people of the garden. Okay, so God has infinite knowledge and we describe that in our theology using the categories of pure reason of the intellect by saying that God knows all that is necessary. All mathematical relations, all geometrical relations, 
all relations of trigonometry and calculus, all binaries, all number systems, and he knows all opposites, all contraries, all relations to them, and he knows all that is impossible. So the impossible, although it does not exist in the external world, it is known to the knowledge of God. In all of its delusions, all of its confusions, all of its confoundations, it's all known. And God knows all that is possible. And what is all that is possible? It means that before the creation of the heavens and the earth, God knew you. And he knew how you would be created, when you would be created. He knew how the fetus would grow. He knew how you would be born. He knew that tonight on this night, which is the first of Rabi al Awwal or the last day of Safar, you know, the 11th of January, that you would be sitting here and you'd be wearing that and you'd be sitting here and you'd be wearing that and all the thoughts that are in your mind, none of that was unknown to God. All of that was known to him before the creation of the heavens and the earth. And he also knew all other possibilities that would not be. Such as the fact that I could have a twin brother, but I don't. But how would the world be if I had a twin brother? And what if he were sitting next to me right here? So God knows that also. And he knows if I had triplets. All possibility, a, a, a triplet brother, right? All possibilities God knows. Those that he will create and those that he will not create. He knows everything. And the world of creation that he makes from the throne, the arsh, to the farsh, from the throne of God, which is the greatest of all created things, to the earth itself, the grass on the top of the earth. You know, that possible reality is beyond comprehension. God knows all the atoms. And he knows every individual atom. And he knows it before its creation. And he knows every molecule. And he knows every composition. He knows every tree. He knows every leaf. And you know that from the Qur'an. The Qur'an tells you that. But you have to know that this is absolutely true and necessary. It is the reality of how necessary being, which is perfect, perfect, perfect and totally efficacious and the act of which is a pure act relates to every cell, every atom, every leaf and he knows every leaf that falls from every tree and he knows every hair on your head and he relates to it perfectly and directly. Okay, this is confounding. That's why Imam al-Haddad said, as we've said now three or four times, that the disbeliever who does not know God is confounded by creation. Because creation is astounding. Especially today with modern science, we know about that. Many things we didn't know before. We didn't know about DNA. As we said before, Darwin, when he looked at the amoeba, he thought the amoeba is just a bunch of jelly that's alive. Now we know the amoeba has in it the DNA molecule, which is extremely complex. Although, in the case of the amoeba, the molecule is a short program. But it's exactly the same molecule that is in you. This cannot be by chance. This cannot have happened. This has got to be created and caused by will and power and knowledge. It cannot be any other way. That is not rationally acceptable. It is not acceptable in our hearts. It is not acceptable in any way. So again, this knowledge of God, it brings to our minds the miracle of the world around us. The absolutely miraculous nature of every breath we take, everything that we see. God knows all possible things, meaning that you know, like how many possibilities are in this watch? How many attributes are in this watch? How many parts are in this watch? 
So he knows every one of those. But every one of these, like the watch band, how many other possibilities would be valid for this watch band, even as a watch band, other than the ones that are here? It's made out of a particular type of rubber, plastic, you know, it's black, as you can see, it's got so many holes in it, perforations. How many other possibilities are also valid regarding this watch band? How many? A thousand? Ten thousand? A million? What would you say? Nuha, what would you say? What did you say? Infinite, 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 infinite. You cannot imagine one, but that you can imagine another. And for you and me, we are not capable of doing that very much. But God knows in his knowledge, it is makshuf, munkeshif to him. All of the possibilities. All of the possibilities. And the possibilities of the worlds that do not exist. And of the worlds that do exist, what is the bigger set? The world that exists is the tiny set. Right? Because it is the choice. It is the choice selection of infinite, infinite other selections. And we'll talk about that when we come to the will. Because لَيْسَ فِي الْإِمْكَانِ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا كَانٌ It is not, this is the best of all possible worlds. This is our theology. The West picked this up from us in Leibniz, and also Descartes, uh, not Descartes, but uh, Voltaire, okay? But they got it from us. But when we say this is the best of all possible worlds, لَيْسَ فِي الْإِمْكَانِ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا كَانْ We mean by that that God in creating this world, even in creating evil, even in creating harm, even in creating the virus and disease, that this is the best test because this world is a test. And the garden will be the best of the best of the best. And the fire will be the fire. And it's true. It is not a metaphor. And it is cosmologically necessary, by the way. Not just an ethical proposition. Okay? So, this is the knowledge of God. That these things that exist, as mundane as they are, and as lowly as they may same time, sometimes appear. You know, we see trash in this world, right? We see beautiful things and things that are not beautiful. And we see people who live in poverty. You know, I've been to parts of the world where people live in great poverty. Parts of India, for example. Where people are living in poverty on the streets with nothing. Okay? All of but this is this is all known to God. And he also knew all other possibilities instead. So uh, this is the nature of his knowledge. And we say that the knowledge of God has one cosmological relation. And in Arabic we call that ta'alluq. We say that it has one ta'alluq. It has one cosmological relation. And this is very important because among the most important theological questions is how does unicity, which is the essential negative attribute of God, relate to multiplicity? Infinite, infinite multiplicity. This is the big theological question. To establish that God is one Almost every philosopher does that if they use pure reason. But how does the one relate to plurality? That's where they have a problem. This is why in late antiquity you had dualism and you had the notion of the transcendence of God because they believe that God cannot know particulars. He can't know that you're breathing right now. Because this would put multiplicity in God. He knows universals, but he does not know particulars. Absolutely not. That means you do not know necessary being. Because necessary being is not inside or outside. And necessary being is not imminent or transcendent. Imminent being relates directly to everything created as if it were the only thing created. And this puts no multiplicity 
in created in necessary being. But this is the relationship. So God's relationship to multiplicity is in ta'aluqat, but not in the attribute itself. That's very important and very profound. And it is one of the most important of all theological questions in human history. Polytheism and the different kind of conceptions you get from the polytheists all go back to this. And there are very few religions, even the most polytheistic religions, that don't believe in the one. They believe in the one, but they believe that the one is transcendent. The one is outside of this world. The one is beyond plurality. Okay, so that's not our belief at all. We don't have that belief. And we say that the relation or the ta'alluq of God in his knowledge to all infinite, infinite things known is tenfi ziyun qadim. This is what we say in Arabic. Tenfi ziyun qadim, which means pre-existent efficient. Pre-existent efficient. Meaning that it realizes the manifestation of all of that infinite knowledge as a total disclosure, an infinite, infinite disclosure from pre-existence. Okay? It's God does not learn. God does not discover. God does not think like you and I think. Our knowledge is immediate knowledge. Like we know that the part must be smaller than the whole. Immediate knowledge. Okay? We know that the body must be still in its place or moving. Okay? That's immediate knowledge. And then we have, that's, that's, then we have immediate knowledge. We have knowledge that we know by thinking it out. So if we say, for example, that if this cup moves, then it must be created from nothing. It must be hadith, mawjudun ba'd al-adam. Okay, that is not immediate knowledge, at least not for me. It could be for a very intelligent person. The great mathematicians, they are able to do mathematics on the basis of immediate perception, because it's pure reason. That's why we told the story of Friedrich Gauss, that he would sit on his father's lap. His father was a great mathematician at Göttingen University. And then when he's still a little boy, you know, um, he's about seven years old, he begins to correct his father. Okay, and this is possible in the realm of reason because it doesn't need experience. And this is why you'll find great mathematicians who maybe everything they did, they did at the age of 15. And then the rest of their life, they're just working out the corollaries of what they understood at 15 years age. Okay, so God's knowledge then reveals everything from pre-existence, before the heavens and the earth. And this raises other questions about free will and so forth. But as we said before, we'll talk about that later. Okay, and God's knowledge is not immediate, it is not immediate, it is not, the base, it's not based on thought, it's not based on discovery, uh, anything like that. Okay, then we come to will which in Arabic we call irada, irada. And will is a, an attribute of God that relates to the realm of possible being. Right? So you remember about the ten marbles in the pocket. These marbles cannot be ordered by random. If you see the marbles ordered in any significant order, there had to be an orderer who did that. Okay? So the nature of God's irada is that he selects the possibilities that will be. And he excludes the possibilities that could have been, but will not be. This is what irada does. So, God willed that you be. 
He willed that you be the one to have your identity. That you be the precious human being that you are in the hierarchy of all human beings from the best to the worst. This is one of the secrets of human beings because you have a place. You, you have a unique place that no other human being has in this life and in all future lives. Okay, so God knew these possibilities and God selected the possibilities to be that are the possibilities that pertain to you or to this watch that human beings made or to the tree outside or the hood hood that flies, the hoopoe that flies here you know, and, and looks for insects in the daytime. All of those possibilities, God's will selected. On the basis of what? On the basis of infinite, infinite, infinite knowledge. The total disclosure of all necessities, all impossibilities, all possibilities from the beginning of the beginning before time and space. You know, and this is why we say subhanallah. And this is why you know, you, we have to have fikr when we do dhikr. That when you say subhanallah, you know, what are you saying? You are saying, you know, the magical note, you know, of the music of the spheres. Subhanallah. Especially if you say that with knowledge. This is why some of the awliya, they say that one of the greatest karamas is to do dhikr. Because not everybody can do it. Allah gives you the tawfiq to do dhikr. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. To remember the name of God. To glory be to God. Praise be to God. God is the greatest. Okay, and when we mention God, God mentions us. Right? The hadith tell us that clearly. This is because you are very special. You are extremely special. And they say that if you could hear your name being written in the seventh heaven, when you mention God and he mentions you and he has the angels write your name, you would die from ecstasy. You would not be able to support that. Okay, but this is who you are. You are created for this ecstasy. You are created for this gift. And so you must not turn your back on it. Because if we turn our backs on that, then there is something else that awaits us. Human beings have a cosmic role, a dynamic role. Okay, so the will of God then designates what will be. And therefore we say that the function of will is tarjih and takhsis. Tarjih meaning that in the realm of possible being, everything that exists in the realm of creation, you and me, the cup, the watch, the bird, the flower, the leaf, the hood hood, you know, all of these things have two basic possibilities, right? Which are the possibility to exist and the possibility not to exist. Existence is possible for them. Existence is not possible for the impossible. There cannot be a second God. There cannot be a third God. Even though he may be worshipped in a certain place. But he does not exist. He does not exist. And he cannot exist. Okay? And there cannot be a triangle in Euclidean space, not curved space in which, you know, the sum of the angles is 160. Okay, that's impossible. That is known in the knowledge of God. And all of the confusions that would be based on that delusion are also known in the knowledge of God. Okay, but in the realm of possibilities, you know, God knows that which will be, and these things have the possibility to be or not to be. To be or not to be, that is the question, right? But uh, they don't have that choice to be or not to be. 
To be, you have to have tarjih. You have to have a will that grants preponderance to the possibility of existence over the possibility of non-existence. We call that tarjih, the granting of preponderance, of greater weight. As you know, in the scale of balance, you have the scale of balance, and you have the kafatan, we call them scales in English, and then you have one that is rajihah, and another one which is what? Marjuha. Marjuha. One that is heavy and the other is light. Okay, so this is what the metaphor is from. That God's will grants preponderance to your existence. And you could have had somebody else that existed in your place. You might have had a twin. There could have been a brother that was born instead of you, or a sister instead of you. All that's possible. And all of it was utterly known by God. But he willed that this one exist and not the other. Today and throughout history, we have people with great imaginations. We have people that tell us stories. Sometimes they're true stories, sometimes they're not. You know, we see today in the world of movies all these incredible combinations of possibilities that you see in Star Wars or Harry Potter or the Lord of the Rings or the Golden Compass, you know, and so many other films. God knew all of those possibilities before the creation of the heavens and the earth. Human beings have discovered and cannot discover and have not imagined and cannot imagine anything that he did not know. And he willed that the world of the golden compass, where the souls walk outside the body, you know, will be in Hollywood. You know, and it will exist on the shasha. You know, it will exist, uh, you know, on the film screen. But not probably in the real world. It could. It could. We don't know. But in the realm of possible being, God knows all possibilities and he determines which of those will be and which will not be. And this is also why irada, which is a function of necessary being, excludes the possibility of another God. Because there cannot be a universe where there's another God. All possible universes, and God can create as many universes as he wills. We don't know about that except through revelation. So there could be a universe of the golden compass. I can only know that through revelation or through experience. If maybe on the day of judgment we discover that we've got brothers in the garden or someplace else that come from another universe. But there cannot be another universe of possibilities that was not designated by the will of God. Do you understand that? The will of God is necessary. Therefore, it must relate to all possibilities. And those possibilities are also the possibilities of all other worlds, all other universes. So there can be other worlds, you know, that's not impossible, but this is a matter to be determined by revelation. But there cannot be another God that rules that universe. That is excluded by the nature of the one and necessary being. We say that God's will has two it has two cosmic relations. Okay? One of those is tenfidiyun qadim. One of those is pre-existent efficient. And one of those is suluhiyun qadim. It is pre it is pre-existent sufficient. And what do we mean by that? We mean by that that all possibilities of all possible worlds and all possible universes, parallel universes, anything that you want, 
God's will connected to that from pre-existence, before the creation of heavens and earth, for all time, but it related to that in two ways. One is tenfidiyun qadim. One is pre-existent, efficient. What does that mean? It means that he selected that certain possibilities like you and you and you and the hat on your head and the pin on your lap, that these would be. So this was tenfid. This was executive. This was execution. And it's before the creation of the first thing created. And it has no beginning in time. And the second connection or relation is suluhi qadim, which is pre-existent sufficient. Meaning that the possibility that in this world, instead of having our souls in our bodies, we could have souls that walk along us like panthers or like monkeys or like lions or like little dogs or cats. Okay, that's possible. And God's will knew that. Otherwise it could never have occurred to the person who wrote the film The Golden Camp Compass, which is about the Catholic Church, by the way. That's what it's about. And it's about things like Opus Dei, the work of God, which is a very dangerous fascist organization which does exist. It's very strong in Spain, very strong in Portugal, very strong in Italy, and in parts of South America. And it's not pleasant to talk about Opus Dei. It's not just in the Da Vinci Code. Opus Dei is real and powerful and wealthy. Okay? This is what the, the Golden Compass is about. It's an interesting film. Okay? But God knew all those possibilities. And his will related to that in a relation that is pre-existent, before the heavens and the earth, and which is suluhi, in other words, sufficient. In other words, he could have created that. You know, and he could have created someone else in your place. God created you in his wisdom. You are special. You are unique. And, you know, you have to know that you do know that, inshallah. But if you don't know that, you have to know that. Because there's no other you. There will never be another you. There never was another you. Another you. There can never be. You are you forever and ever. And God selected you to be out of infinite, infinite other possibilities. That's why you have to realize the meaning of your life. And you have to fulfill that task. And when we do that, as people of taklif, people of moral responsibility and license to act, then we change the world. Once you come to life in the way that you're meant to live, with your mind, your heart, your knowledge, everything you have, you illuminate the world, every one of you. And this is what we're here to do. You know, we are here to transform humanity. You know, in this age of the monoculture, you know, that bonsais human beings, that creates human beings that are tiny little trees that look like big trees, but they don't have roots. That's the modern human being. Bonsai, like these little Japanese trees. That's the monoculture. The monoculture that dominates the world today. And it destroys culture, it destroys roots, it destroys individuality, and it destroys humanity. It's very dangerous. We have to bring people to life. And you do that by turning on the light in yourself. And then the light in you turns on the lights in other people. Okay? So irada is one of the great astounding attributes of God. Okay, and again, irada, knowledge, power, we always measure them against the six attributes before. So they are functions of necessary being, absolutely perfect, absolutely unchanging. They cannot be greater, they cannot be less. Full, full, full. 
Okay, and they are pre-existent, uncreated, uncaused, causing everything. And they are eternal. They never cease to be. And they are utterly dissimilar. As Imam Haddad says, the disbeliever who does not know his Lord, what a deprivation. There is no deprivation greater than that. You know, and we have to give that gift back to human beings. You know, that person is confounded by the world. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of them just take it for granted. They don't even think about it because it's too much to think about. We have a lot of people in the United States that don't like silence. They don't want to sit and just be silent. They want to hear music. They want to have distractions. They want somebody to talk to them because it is difficult for them to encounter themselves. It is difficult for them to think about the reality of their lives because they don't know what to do. They don't know what the meaning of this is. That, that breaks my heart. That makes me very sad. You know, we have to be able to teach this beautiful theology. Beautiful theology, which is the truth. Okay? And, um, you know, so uh, this is totally unlike anything. It is dissimilar, the will. It is also self-sufficient. Has no need, doesn't need instruments, doesn't need calculators or computers, anything like that. And it is one. It has no parts. It has no pieces. It determines everything in absolute infinity multiplied by infin infinity to the infinite number of infinity. Multiplicity in the most total way that you cannot imagine, that you are not capable of imagining. Okay, this is the quality of our Lord. That's why we say, Subhanallah, Subuhun, Qudusun, Rabbul Malaikati wa This is who He is. Subuh, He is above any defect. And He is Qudus, even the most beautiful things that we imagine. He is above that. He's more beautiful. He's more perfect than that. Okay? So this is irada. Did you have a question? Um, the root of suluhi is from yasluhu li dharik. Suluhi is sufficient. It means that his irada tasluhu li dharik. That his irada is valid. It is, we can say in English, efficient, sufficient. That's the way I translate it. That may not be the best translation. But in it, his irada is valid to do that. Okay? And then we have after that the attribute of power, of qudra. Thank you. Of qudra. Okay? And what does qudra do? Qudra, which is the power of God, it brings into existence and takes out of existence. It creates and it uncreates. That's what Qudra does. Qudra, power, is what makes the thing exist in time and place. And according to what? According to irada. The irada determines that this will be. And the Qudra makes it be in the right time, in the right place, exactly the way that it was determined and known that it would be before the creation of the heavens and the earth. Okay, this is Qudra, power. This is why we say that all of these things that exist are Hujubu al-Qudra. They are veils of power. Again, you go back to the Adam, this incredible, empty, empty, empty reality of a tiny dot which is also a, a wave that is going around the nucleus 10 billion times in one millionth of a second. Hijab al-Qudra. That's what this is. This is a veil of power. What you are seeing here really is sheer manifestation of the infinite power of God, who is the creator, the greatest creator, 
the perfect creator, the marvelous creator, who does everything beautifully, everything perfectly. That's what you saw. And this is what you are. This is what everything in your world is. This is why also we are people of shukr, that we wake up. I have to give thanks for this life, this existence, this world. Your eyes, your ears, your mind, none of that is by chance. None of that can be taken for granted. And all of that in you is absolutely unique. You have what no other human being ever had or will have. Because everything God creates in the world is unique. Every leaf on every tree is unique, even though to you and me they look exactly the same. Every atom, every hydrogen atom is ex unique, even though they look exactly the same. But this is also one of the marvels of his creation and the fact that he relates to everything as it is. Again, we go back you know, to the delusion of empiricism that we are this tiny little speck lost in a potentially infinite universe. So, and we've got 10 billion people, you know, 6 billion people, whatever, in generations after generations on this tiny speck of dust. How insignificant you are. What does good and evil mean? What difference does it make if you kill 1 or 10 or 60,000 or a million? Absolutely not. This is the ignorance of God, and this is the test of God. And it shows us that this world is not worth the wing of a gnat, as the prophet said, because this is the testing ground. This is just to see who is who. What is your identity? Your identity is beautiful. And inshallah, you will realize that identity. And that will change the time. That is such an easy step for you to make, and it makes all the difference in the world. If we please God, if we are able to please God, that's all that is needed. That, you know, someone like Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, may Allah be pleased with him. This was Shaykh al-Islam, master of the Hanbali school, master of the Shafi'i school. He's the Shaykh of Ibn Taymiyyah, the Shaykh of Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah You know, he was a man of Sharia. And he is born at a time when everything was finished. The Crusaders had taken Jerusalem, they'd taken Ma'abra, they occupied the land, there were fitness everywhere, the order of the assassins, Muslims were fighting each other, they could not agree on anything. And then when he appears and he begins to teach, decade after decade, who comes? Salah al-Din, Nur al-Din, and all their soldiers. These are the murids of Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani. And he is able to change the ulama. And he takes the path of al Ghazali, Ihya Ulum al Din, and he brings it to life. How did he do that? Because he has no power. He's a human being like you and me. Because everything about him, Sultan al Awliya, was Ridallah. I will please God with my soul. I will give him everything just to please him. And if you please Allah, then he can change the world just like that. Because it's all about that. We have to please Allah. We have to do the religion of the beloved, of the beloved messenger, the messenger who smiled, who was always smiling. This is the Prophet Muhammad. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would go out of Medina, you know, on any kind of a trip or an errand or a mission, and he came back to the Medina, the beautiful city of Medina, who were the first people to welcome him? The children. The children are waiting. When will he come back? When will he come back? And when they see the Prophet, the children rush out to meet the Prophet. So what kind of a man is that? Children are awliya. Children are saints. And they love the Prophet. This, this, is, the, this is our Prophet. We have to be like that. We have to be like that. This is our legacy. Okay? And when we are like that, then we can give to the world. And the world needs this gift that we have. Okay? So, uh, irada is a very important aspect of our belief. Again, when we talk about this delusion that we are so few, we are so little, 
lost in this huge universe. Okay? This is because we don't know God. And because we don't bring God into the equation. Because when we know the oneness of God, the necessity of his existence, the perfection of existence, which this world cannot be accounted for without that. You know? That that which has no existence from its essence, which is me and you and the cup and the pillar and the flower and the hoodhood, Okay, that which has no existence. You didn't give yourself existence. You cannot do that. Your existence is impossible. If it were not for God who tipped the scales and said you will be, and you will be like this, perfect. Because of all the things that you could have been other than what you are, you were chosen to be this way. Even if there might be a defect. You know, but you were meant to be that way because that's part of your perfection. That's part of your perfection. Some people are made blind, but they can see. Some people are given eyes, but they don't see, they're blind. Okay? But see, another thing too is that quantitative science, empirical science, it must generalize because it has to use comparisons in mathematics. So, for example, we have to say that this cup is just like this cup. Okay? And therefore, there are two of them. And I can count them, I can multiply them, I can divide them. Right? So, we have to say, for example, that all the leaves on this tree are the same because they're acacia leaves or they're lope leaves or whatever they make, but they're not. We have to generalize. And we are allowed to do that. It's a type of najaz. We're allowed to do that to do science. But again, we must never forget that, in fact, this was just a generalization. Every leaf there is unique. Okay? But when we make these generalizations and we quantify the world, this is also what makes it big and small and what makes the human being get lost in it. Okay? Irada, when it relates to what will be, and this is the connection of irada, which is tenfidiyun qadim, which is if e- eternal, which is pre-existent, efficient, right? So that we call al-qadha. We call that the divine decree. The divine decree. That's al-qadha. Al-qadha is the manifestation of the will of God as it designates before the creation of the heavens and the earth and time and place, all things that will be, that you will be. And on this night you will be here, and tomorrow night you will be there. Okay, this is qadha. And qadr, which is destiny in time and place, this is the function of qudra, of power. That power will then bring that Reality that was willed by God in the realm of possible being into existence in the right moment, in the right place, exactly the way that God willed it to be. Okay? And again, this necessarily brings up the question of free will, but if you'll be patient, we will talk about that later. Because I'd like to talk about the attributes and then we'll talk about that. Uh, and we'll talk about evil, and we'll talk about causation, and, and other things. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma iftah alayna bi hikmatika, wa anshur alayna bi rahmatika. <coughs> ya dhal jalali wal ikram. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi, adad kamali lahi kama yaliqu bi kamalihi. يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تؤاخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. There's a question that came 
about the dua that I make and um, any of you who want that dua, I'm very happy to give it to you. Um, maybe we'll find time to write it out and translate it, although we may not have time to do that in the next days. I mean, if you would want to do that, I would be honored if you did it, if you have time. But, you know, I would be very happy to do that. We can translate it, we can write it out, we could put it online. Uh, it's, a du- it's a dua that I got from my mashayikh, and it, it's, I like to always start with that, and there's lots of blessing. Uh, we try to go through the questions quickly. They're, they're really good questions, and I will keep these questions. I will use these questions in the future. You stated earlier that all possibilities God selected by His will, um, with His infinite knowledge. What drives God's will? What is His ultimate purpose of selecting the possibilities that He selects? Is the driving purpose His love for humanity, divine justice, ultimate holiness or righteousness, etc., etc.? Very good question. Uh, this is a question that we do not deal with in Aqidah because uh, it's, this is, in Aqidah is related to salvation. It is re- related to what you have to know in order to be sound in your worship and in your obedience to God. Then there is a whole other dimension of the religion which is about the structure of reality. What is reality in itself? And this often is not part of Aqidah. Aqidah simply lays the foundation in which we can build the palace that will also include that. Okay? But God wills to create creation according to His infinite knowledge. And that infinite knowledge is filled with wisdom and purpose. So the world that He creates, which has in it good and evil, is for a very high purpose. And the creation of the garden and the fire is also for a very high purpose. It's not just an ethical matter that you did wrong, you get slapped. No, it's not. It's something else. It's something in addition to that. Um, We can talk about these things, but when we talk about them, we're talking about what we call haqqa'iq, We're talking about ultimate realities in the structure of reality. And that is not part of Aqidah. The Aqidah is discursive. It pertains to the basic knowledge that we can all agree on. Okay, so we can talk about these things. We can do that for sure. And in fact, some of the questions that are going to come are very similar to this one, so we'll go on to other questions. Okay, is that all right? Um, After yesterday's class, I was talking to a friend about the class. Conversation brought up some questions that we all probably had some time and just pushed away. God is great. God is big. We actually don't say He's big because that's very physical in English. When we say He's kabir, we mean that everything else is saghir. We mean that everything else is insignificant with regard to Him but he's not big in size. and So in English, we, we, we don't say big, because big is, in the English language, always has a sense of physical size. But God is greater than everything. Why couldn't he just not allow the devil to talk to Adam and Eve? Um, you know, uh, to eat the apple. Actually, in Islam, we don't believe it was an apple. And I don't know where the apple came from, because there's no apple in the Bible either. Um, the Adam ate from the tree, the shajara. In Arabic, what is a shajara? Do you know? When najmu wa shajaru yasjudan. And najm here is grass. Najma in Arabic means to appear, like out of nowhere. So the star appears, najma. But grass also, you know, it can be dry and it can die and then the rain can come and then it becomes green, it grows. Najma. So when Najmu wa shajaru yasjudan, the Najm here is like the grass and things like that. Shajar in Arabic is any plant that has a stalk. It's not just a tree. It could be a bush, it could be also wheat because wheat has a stalk. So in the Arabic definition of a tree, 
we, we're not thinking of just these trees out here. We're talking about any plant that has a stalk, a sap. And that's why in our commentary they say that the tree was wheat. Or some say the tree was fig. Or they say, I think it was grape. You know, they, they suggest different things, but never apple. I don't know where the apple came from. And of course it's very important that Adam ate, you know, uh, not Eve. You know, she, she's, she's not guilty here in any way. And that's, that's the account, that's the, the prophetic account. Um, <clears throat> you know, that he will um, talk us about, to, to us about disbelief. Um, God creates Satan. Satan is the embodiment of evil. Satan, according to many traditions, um, existed a long time before his fall, thousands of years. And it's said that Satan was called the Arif Billah, he was called the knower of God, the Zahid of God, he was called the Wa'id of the Malaika. In every heaven he had a beautiful name. And he was called Azazil. He was called the glory of God himself. And he was the greatest of the spirits. And he believed. And in fact, he was with the earthly angels in particular. And the angels who were commanded to prostrate were not all angels. They're the earthly angels. You have many types of angels. The earthly angels are the most like us and spirits. They're the ones who ask the question. Gabriel doesn't ask that question. Michael doesn't ask that question. But the earthly angels, they are very much like human beings. They're very much also like jinn. They're the ones that ask the question. Um, the secret of Satan was not known to anyone until the appearance of Adam. And these are again haqqaiq. These are realities. They are not things that we talk about in creed. In the creed we just take the story and we will say when we talk about prophets, that Adam earned no sin. What Adam did was disobedience, but he earned no sin because he's ma'asum, he's a prophet. So we say he is outwardly commanded not to eat and he is inwardly commanded by God to eat. And this is because of the fact that by eating, even though he establishes a precedent that will be a test for his children, he begins the whole process of the testing of human beings, which begins with the perfect human being, Adam, and with his children, and the first generations of Adam. Adam has over 20 children in Eve, and you know, each time that Eve delivered, she had a twin. This is why some religions like Zoroastrian religion, they, and a lot of ancient religions, they put very special uh, symbolic importance on twins because twins go back to the very beginning and so there was always a boy and a girl, a boy and a girl and a boy and a girl and they were not allowed to marry their twin but they could marry another sibling that was of another delivery and that's because there's nobody else. This is the way the human family begins and in Zoroastrian religion and Magian religion they interpret this in ways that we won't go into right now, you know. But, um, you know, this was the wisdom of God. And that first generation, these were great people. Thullatun min al Vast numbers of the first generations were great people. And then they also had among those, those were not that way. Uh, in any case, um, God's purpose was to test human beings and he creates a being who will do that and this is Satan and all beings are manifestations of the names of God but Satan is as it were a manifestation of the name Al-Mudil the one who leads astray and this is not clear until Adam comes into existence this is what we talk about in haqqa'iq, and you don't have to believe this. I believe it's true, you know, but there is great purpose in the creation of Satan and of human beings. 
because we are to be tested to see who we are and to bring out this identity, you know, which is who you really were and who you are now. So God has wisdom in this. Um, you know, John Milton, who's a very interesting poet, he wrote Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained and Samson Agonistes. Um, when he wrote Paradise Lost, he was an Arian Christian. Even though if you read it, you'll think it's Trinitarian, but it's not. And then Paradise Regained, he is a Unitarian. And Samson Agonistes is almost like he's a Muslim because he became so close to us at the end of his life, he even acknowledged that Muslims would have salvation. You know, and Samson Agonistes is a poem that any Muslim can read easily and uh, accept. But John Milton in Paradise Lost, this is what he's talking about. Why is Satan there? And what he shows is that for human beings to be as great as they are capable of being and to bring out the light of the prophets in history, you've got to have this antagonist. So this is his nature. And God has wisdom in that. How do we have a choice in life, in believing and not believing, if not believing and not practicing means going to hell, to the fire? It's not really a choice. Uh, my answers uh, were not um, solid and confident, but mainly revolved around some things we cannot comprehend, 70,000 veils between us and creation and so forth. Again, this also pertains to free will, and if you permit me, we will put this off to the end. And then we want to talk about it in a way that I hope will be satisfactory. But <clears throat> you do have a choice. You make that choice. And God also knew the choice that you would make. We do not believe there is a contradiction here, even though that sounds like the clearest contradiction we could possibly speak about. But we will talk about that we have what we call the doctrine of acquisition, al-kasb al iktisab <coughs> and we will talk about that uh, later, bi ta'ala. Um, the fire has a purpose, there are other questions here that pertain to that, maybe we can talk about that more when we get to them. When we say that the two schools of theology have been preserved for us as the truth by the will of God, are we not using a weak argument? God preserved Trinitarian Christianity, for instance, and other false creeds are gaining followers within the Muslim community. It seems that using the will of God to prove the validity of an argument is not necessarily a sound proof. Um, we don't believe that the, uh, the school of the early Salaf and the school of the Khalaf are valid because they exist. We don't believe that they are valid because it was the will of God that they continue to exist. We believe that they are authentic, that they are valid because they properly interpret the, relate, the revelation of the prophet and they lay the proper foundation for understanding God. So we base that on their content and we base that also on their history. And uh, in Islam we have many sectarian divisions some of which remain to the present day. So the fact that a thing exists, that does not mean that it's true. And if we look at the history of Christianity, Christianity, Judaism, all world religions, they have similar histories, and their histories are always histories of internal conflict. That Jews disagreed among themselves bitterly about many things. In the Dead Sea Scrolls community, the Essenes, the Qumran community. They say that if we don't protect this message, which is the message that the Christ will come and that he will be followed by the prophet of the end of days, who is the Deuteronomy prophet, we would be killed by the Jews. And they say that we have the correct recitation of the, and they're Jews. They say we have the correct recitation of the book, but if we expose this to the Jews, we would be killed. If you came to the community of Qumran and you wanted to be accepted, you had to be a, a Jew, you had to be an Israelite, you had to be circumcised, you had to know the law, and you had to be tested for two years. And also, 
it had to be shown that you could keep secrets. Otherwise, you would not be let into the community. And this is because they believed that they were the ones who were preserving the secrets of Moses, which other Jews were not interested in knowing. So this is part of Jewish history. This is the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls also tell us that the Psalms of David were more than 4,000, whereas the Psalms of David that exist in the Bible today are 150. <clears throat> And they tell us many things. They tell us about the scrolls of Abraham. It's amazing. They also tell us that there are other collections of manuscripts like theirs that are not known, that are not hidden. Very, very interesting. So how can we talk about the history of Judaism if we don't talk about this? And the Pharisees, who are the ones who will win out in the history of Judaism, they regard it as disbelief to even look in the book of an Essene or the book of a Saduki, a Sadducee. In the history of Christianity, also, you have big divisions. Um, in the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant Reformation succeeds in Europe because of the Ottoman Turks. The Ottoman Turks are the ones who protect the Protestant princes. We know this from the Ottoman archives. Queen Elizabeth had a whole uh, wardrobe of Muslim noble clothing that she would put on to receive Muslim ambassadors. She has letters with you know, the Queen of Turkey, Sophia Baffo, who was a convert from Italy. And Sophia writes to uh, her that the Muslims are behind you, you know, because and we hope that you will be victorious under the banner of Christ. And the Protestants would come to the Ottoman Empire and they would say that we are monotheists. And, and, and the Ottomans like that. Okay? I mean, but the Protestant, in the Protestant Reformation, you know, um, most of the Protestants were Trinitarians. And you had certain people like Michael Severus who say that no. They say the Trinity has no basis in the Bible. This is the position of John Milton. This is the position of John Locke. This is the position of Isaac Newton and many others. There's no basis for the Trinity anywhere in the Bible. So why are we Trinitarians? This develops over a period of 350 years, going through five stages, beginning in Alexandria, in Egypt, Alexandrian theology. So, you know, uh, in, hist in the history of Christianity, Unitarians are pushed out. Arians are pushed out. And Arians were the majority. Arian Christians who believe that Jesus was not the pre-existent Son of God. He's the Messiah. And they would call him the Son of God. But not in the sense that he is God. And, you know, the, the Germanic tribes, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Lombards, the Vandals, these were all Arian Christians. The Goths who conquered Rome were Aryan Christians. They were not pagans. What happens to them? They are wiped out. Irish Christianity. Irish Christianity was a beautiful Christianity. And it is wiped out. They, weren't, they were not Roman Catholics. Irish Christians who say, a pilgrim, why do you go to Rome? You will not find the son of Mary there. You know, why do you go to Rome? It's very dangerous and you will not find the sign, son of Mary in Rome. And the Roman church will get rid of Irish Christianity. You know, so when we talk about the history of religions, we have to talk about these different differences that are among them. And we need to do that honestly and intelligently and objectively. And, you know, this may make some people angry and sad. But, you know, um, political... Correctness is one thing. We're polite people. But we also have to tell the truth about history. You know, so in Islam, when we say that certain traditions are authentic, we don't ever mean that they're authentic because they still exist. No. And again, in the history of Islam, we have to revive what is authentic. We have to please God. And that which pleases God is that which is authentic that goes back to the Prophet by a chain of transmission. Um, why is the fire cosmologically necessary? I said that, didn't I? Yeah, but that's haqqa'iq. That's not aqidah. In aqidah we just say that the fire is possible 
God willed it to be, there it is. Take it or leave it. Aqidah is sometimes rougher on the edges, you know, but um, in reality, you know, our great scholars, our great scholars of haqqaiq, they will tell you amazing things, but they're not always things that are easy to talk about, and they're not always things that are easy to understand. But the idea that the garden and the fire are cosmologically necessary, if it makes any sense to you, doesn't make much sense to me, is because of the nature of multiplicity. It is because of this very thing that we talked about, that out of unicity comes infinite multiplicity. And the infinite multiplicity that comes out is also a hierarchy of being. And it has in it majesty and beauty. And it has in it evil and good. And one of the reasons why this earth is so insignificant, not worth the nap, the wing of the nap, is so that for a very short time it can be a place where good and evil play themselves out and you see who is who. Who is the majestic person? Who is the beautiful person? Who is the one who lives in the ring of mercy? And who is the one who lives in the ring of majesty and justice? Okay, so you have evil people. You have evil spirits. Satan is an evil one. But this does not become clear until Adam is created. And this is something that pertains to Marathi al wujud, to the stages of existence, because the, the more that existence manifests itself, the more the opposites become clear. And then Satan sees who he is. And this story of Satan, that God creates Adam and he teaches him all the names and he commands the angels to prostrate to him, um, you will find in the Bible that it only makes vague reference to that. But that is a basic Jewish belief a fundamental Judaic belief. Rabbinic theology begins with the test of Adam. And the Jews have that whole story, not in the Bible, just like we don't have everything in the Quran. We've got Hadith, we've got Tafsir, we've got Fiqh, right? The Jews are like that too. They've got Midrashim, you know, they've got the Talmud, they have the Mishnah, the Gemara, and so forth. And in the Midrashim, they've got the whole story. And they've got more detail on it than we have. And in rabbinic theology, that is where it begins. It's what they call Adam Qadmun. They mean uh, Adam al Qadim. Adam Qadmun. This is Adam, they mean before he falls. And he's taught all the names, and the angels are told to prostrate, and Satan doesn't. And this is why also when Al Baqarah begins, you know, with the story of Adam, to me it's astounding because it's talking to the Jews and this is their fundamental belief in the Midrashim, among the rabbis and others. So, um, in any case, uh, the cosmological reality of the garden and the fire is because of the nature of multiplicity. But you don't have to understand that and you don't have to agree to that. But that is haqiqah. And this is so that, because creation glorifies God. And creation is meant to glorify God in the most perfect and knowledgeable way. And so therefore, what is evil will become majestic. But it will continue to be manifested in the fire. Okay, and you know, I don't know we should, if we should even talk about stuff like that. But, uh, you know, those are haqqa'iq that explain these things. To me it's very significant. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. You know, this is you. This is you. You're honorable people. You're nice people. You're good people. I'm really honored to be here. Happy to be here. And you're very polite. You're very welcoming. Otherwise I wouldn't be able to talk. You know that um, um, we say, this man is a man of knowledge. This man is a man of knowledge. Many of you are people of knowledge. Um, I love knowledge. And that's almost all I love. And we say, Al-ilmu aziz. 
إن أعطيته كلك أعطاك بعضه وإن أعطيته بعضك لم يعطيك شيئا Knowledge is precious If you give it all of yourself it will give you part of itself If you give it part of yourself it won't give you anything I, mean, I love knowledge I've loved it all my life Right? So if all I could do is study I would be happy this man would be that way, this man would be that way, many of you would be that way. Um, but for me, knowledge is precious. And so therefore, if I have students who don't like the knowledge, very hard for me to teach. Often in the university, I had to teach students who didn't want to be taught. And I won't say where that was and who they were, but especially in teaching comparative religions, I, I had a whole syllabus in Arabic I taught in Arabic, you know, and uh, I had some Egyptian students for a while. They were good. They're writing down everything, you know, because like they have to read 30 years to get this. I didn't find, they say, what book? It's not in one, it's in a hundred books, you know, and they're writing it down. And, and they would even make notes. And they say, you could use this if you want. And then after a while, we didn't have any more Egyptians. And then we had another type of student. And that student is just like, yeah, we're staff. They would even go to the department head, head and they say, tell him not to teach so much. <laughs> you know, and get rid of this subject and that subject, it's too much. And they'd say, write it down so we can memorize it. I said, well, I won't do it. Because that's all they want, they want to memorize it. And, then, and I said, even if you memorize it, I will get you. Because that's what they do, they memorize it. And then I would make certain tests, like I used true and false and, and, and multiple choice, which is the dumbest test there is. It's very easy to grade. And I would give them multiple choice, and I would give the same thing, but I change it. They said, yeah, Ustad, this is not what we memorized. I said, yeah, I know it's not what you memorized. Is it true or false? <laughs> and they just repeat what they said. And, oh, I don't know. It's like Masakin, you know, they, they can't think because they weren't trained to think. Not because they're stupid, but they, they weren't trained. And uh, so with comparative religion, it's like, cut it down. I mean, first I was teaching about Zoroastrianism, Confucianism, Buddhism, and the Egyptians loved it. Egyptians were choo, writing it down, you know, and the Yemenis too. I had Yemeni students too, you know, and then, but these other ones, Allah Yahdihim. You know, it's like, and then when they were the only students, they, they went to the head of the department and they said, just Christianity and Judaism and one other religion. And then don't use your notes, use the books that are there. So I use Hassan Bada, I use some other books like that. But, um, you know, and they want something they can memorize. You know, so it was hard for me to teach. Because, like, I love this stuff. I love it, you know. And if you don't love it, I don't think I want to teach you. Whereas if I have an Egyptian who's sitting there and, like, writing down, oh, like, we will talk and talk and talk. So thank you. Because this is the secret of the student and the teacher. You know, that um, you know, if the teacher is a real teacher and loves knowledge, you can only give a person who wants it. And if they don't want it, you don't want to give it either. Very hard to teach people that don't appreciate the value of what you're teaching. Uh, I am confused about a concept that maybe our minds aren't supposed to understand. If God is Qadim, then how do we ascribe to him a ta'alluq uh, al-qudra uh, al-hadithah, or oh, al-hadith, at tanjizi that occurs in time and place? How are the created events of the world ascribed to a pre-eternal being? Thank you for this clarification. Very good question. Extremely good question. Um, and we didn't talk about this actually, but Qudra, power, it has uh, two relations. There's some difference of opinion about that. But it has one which is Suluhi Qadim. In other words, that divine power from pre existence is sufficient to create anything, anything in the realm of possible being. Okay, and this is very important because God is creator before creation. The Maturidis have a different way of talking about that. They have what they call tequeen. 
and we won't get into that, but it's very interesting. Is Al-Maturidi is trying to solve this in another way. This is a big problem. And for us, we say that Qudra has the ability to create in time and space. And it has another ta'alluq, which is tenfidiyun hadith. It is efficient and temporal, meaning that power actually creates you in this moment of time and place. And this is just to say that God is the creator and he can create. And the problem here is no different from the problem that pertains to God's knowing everything and possible being. And God's will surveying everything in possible being and deciding that this is the wisest and best and it will be and the other one will not be. Now this is the aspect of multiplicity which in the world of haqqa'iq is a reality of heaven and hell. You know, again, I just put that out there. It maybe makes no sense. But th this is what that is talking about. Is the infinite possibilities of all possibilities, those that will be in this world and those that will not. Okay, so um, let's go on to the next question and maybe you know, we can talk more about this. If I don't answer the question adequately and you want to ask questions, please do that. Uh, how are we free and we... Uh, hmm. Own, I think, our acts and decisions and everything is already written. Um, this is a question about free will. So, inshallah, we will talk about that probably Sunday evening. Okay? Um, it's a very important question. But in order for me to answer that, I need a lot of time. Okay? So we'll do that, if you don't mind, on Sunday. Is that okay? All right. Uh, what is the music of the spheres? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure that there is music of the spheres, but the Greeks talk about it. Plato talks about it. And, you know, Allah, you know, uh, He knows everything in the heavens, everything in the earth. All the things in the heavens are good. You know, the heavens are beyond evil. Evil cannot reach them. They are protected. And of course, we see a certain physical heaven in telescopes, but that's not all that's there in any way. That's a mulki, physical heaven, a first heaven. There's also the malakuti heaven. There's also other realities there, and there are doors that open. Okay, but that is a good world. That is a special world. That is an angelic world also. And that is a world in which there is great knowledge manifested. There's also the tablets of light that tell about destiny, and they are in one of the heavens that you and I do not see. Okay, so many ancient people believed that the spheres of the heavens have a music that is extremely beautiful to the being and is perfect harmony and that also expresses the harmony of the sun and the moon and the stars and the zodiacal signs, which are amazing. These are amazing realities, okay? And that this is beauty upon beauty. And so therefore, like instead of Big Bang, I would talk about the music of the spheres. The first perfect note of the music of the spheres. You know, the light of the Prophet Muhammad so the first thing created, the most perfect of all things created. And we have the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah, you know, um, where Jabir asked the Prophet, what is the first thing that God created? And Jabir says, Nuru Nabiika ya Jabir. And this is a Sahih hadith. It has a Sahih transmission in um, the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba or the Musannaf of Abdul Razak in the manuscript, not actually in the book, in the printed book. So it's an amazing hadith. But it's again about haqiqah, it's about ultimate reality, it's not about salvation. But for Big Bang Theory, it is useful. Because the first thing that God creates is the light. And it is the most beautiful of all things. And of that he creates everything else. And that we could talk about the metaphor of the music of the spheres. 
the first perfect note that contains the whole symphony of the music of the spheres forever. And Allah knows best. I mean, but that's a better metaphor than Big Bang. It was not confusion. It was not chaos. So the music of the spheres is a metaphor. Whether there's actually music there or not, I don't know. I don't know. How is Allah light? Allah nuru samawati wa Allah's speech is uncreated. Okay, but the Messiah is kalimatullah. Isn't Jesus a word of Allah? Um, inshallah, we'll talk about this tomorrow. Because tomorrow we want to talk about the speech of God, which is a beautiful topic, a beautiful topic. God is light and God also creates light. The light that you and I relate to in the universe is created light. The light of the Prophet Muhammad, which we could talk about at great length, is also created light. But God is also light. And as we said before, when we speak about God as light, we are speaking about necessary existence. And necessary existence is the reality of realities. And that light, which is the light of God, which is a reflection of his necessary existence, is like that. But they're not the same thing exactly. And there's no confusion there. Just like in the case of Jesus, there is the uncreated speech of God. We'll talk about that tomorrow. And Jesus is also a word of God. He's created by the word of God. Kun, be. Okay? And Jesus is a great messenger. Okay? And inshallah we'll talk about that tomorrow, hopefully more. Does predetermination conflict with free will and with human responsibility and accountability? And our theology has different ways of analyzing that, but it insists on that fact that we have responsibility, we have accountability, we have choice, and we are actors. You are a fa'il or a fa'ila, and God is the fa'al. He is the great doer. And inshallah, we will talk about that Sunday. Um, what is the meaning of istafti qalbak wa in aftak in nas wa aftok? If I trust a sheikh and he gives a fatwa, and another sheikh gives a different fatwa about the same issue, and at the same time, because I need this thing, my heart tells me not to take the fatwa of the Shaykh I trust, what should I do? Um, this is the hadith of Wabisa, right? And, um, you know, so he comes to the Prophet and uh, the Prophet uh, says to him, you came to ask about what? What does the hadith go? Do you to test al al-bir, right? Is that how the hadith go? Istafti qalbak. That's true, right? That's how the hadith go. I, I sort of don't remember it exactly at this moment. But that's a very beautiful hadith, you know, in which the Prophet says to one of his companions, uh, take a fatwa from your heart. But again, that is a statement addressed to a companion who has a really good heart and who uh, can do that sincerely. So we wouldn't necessarily say to everybody we know, ask your heart, because they won't ask their heart, they'll ask their nafs, and they will do the thing that they shouldn't do. But if we are properly trained, and we are sincere, then the heart is there. And in any case, you know, uh, when we are told things that are not right, we have this feeling of raib, we have this feeling of unco being uncomfortable. So this is very important, you know, that Truth, you know, it doesn't yaribuk, it doesn't cause, um, it doesn't cause uh, doubt in your heart. And um, therefore, you know, we, we have to look for the, the path which is the, 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 the most, the safest. And in the case of fatwas, one of the things about the fatwa, the fatwa is not the same as a hukum. It's not the same as a ruling that is given by a ruler or a judge. A ruling that is given by a ruler or a judge, you have to do whether you like it or not. If the ruler says that you've got to stop at the red light, you have to stop at the red light. If he says you can go on the green light, you can go on the green light. That's his prerogative. prerogative. That's a hukum. 
The fatwa is a legal judgment that is given to you that by its nature is not binding. Okay, you go to the mufti, and of course it's proper if you have a good mufti and he or she gives you uh, a fatwa. And we have great women muftis, by the way. Fatima as Samarqandi, who was one of the greatest Hanafi fuqaha ever in Halab. She was one of the greatest in the Hanafi school. And Al Kashani, um, who wrote Bada'i as Sana'i, he was her husband, and he wouldn't sign a fatwa unless she also signed it before him. You know, but the mufti, you know, if uh, it is a good mufti and a sound one, then it's, you should follow them. You know, you trust them. But again, you're not bound to do that. And we can ask for different, different fatwas. It's not good to shop and to go around and to get the fatwa that is the most pleasing. Um, we have to do ijtihad in the people that we follow. Uh, why do you say that empiricism is the least definitive and most conjectural form of knowledge? Aren't chemistry, physics, and biology empirical sciences? How are these sciences <coughs> conjectural? Um, very good question. Really good question. Um, empirical knowledge, which is what I see, what I hear, what I taste, what I touch, what I smell, you know, it's got to go beyond the senses. If it goes beyond the senses, then it can be real knowledge, like medical knowledge, chemistry and physics. But when we reduce knowledge just to empiricism, and we say that there will be no metaphysical intrusions in this, in other words, you will not be able to use pure reason and tell me that the world is actually created from nothing. No, I will not allow that. I will call that a metaphysical intrusion. It's not metaphysical. It is pure reason just telling you what you saw. Okay? So when you reduce empiricism to the only source of knowledge, then it becomes very weak indeed. And today we have, uh, in the wake of modernity, we have post-modernity. You have post-modernism. And postmodernism, in many ways, is the most honest statement about people who only accept empirical knowledge as their source. No revelation, no pure reason. Okay, because my eyes, my ears, my tongue, my hand, my, my nose, they cannot tell me the meaning of anything. They cannot tell me that there is design. They cannot tell me that there is purpose. They cannot tell me that this is beautiful and that is ugly. You know, we say today was a beautiful day. The sun was shining, the weather was nice. Okay? My eyes didn't tell me that. My ears didn't tell me that. You know, my heart told me that. It took this information and it interpreted it. And it said, this is beautiful. Okay? Um, if the sand were blowing, you know, and the sky were covered with darkness. And I go outside and I get sand in my eyes. Can I say that's ugly? On the basis of empirical knowledge, if that's all you've got, you can't make that decision. That's just reporting something else. In order to say that the day when there's nothing but sand and wind and cold, that that's an ugly day, that's not from your eyes, that's not from your ears, that's not from your touch or taste or smell. That's from something else. It's from your heart, it is from what you want, your need, and for the postmodernist, that's purely relative. Okay, so don't tell me this is true, don't tell me that's false. Um, the postmodernist is not right, they are wrong, but they are honest in that. If we do not have pure reason, and if we do not have revelation, and if we cannot listen to the heart, and if the heart is not part of you know, the um, judgments that we make, you know, then we have to say that everything is relative. You just like it, I don't like it. Okay? So uh, empiricism is not able to tell us the most basic thing. Empirical knowledge only becomes valuable when we can use reason in conjunction with it and the heart 
and revelation. And this is really important. I mean, today, for example, we have big crisis in knowledge, big crisis in knowledge. We have a civilization that produces more information than human beings have ever imagined. And we have specialists in every single field, in physics and chemistry, in law even. And the more specialized people become, the more ignorant they become. This is the reality. And our fields of science don't even speak to each other. Sociology does not speak the language of anthropology. Anthropology speaks different languages. And they don't even communicate with each other. Sociology speaks different languages and they don't communicate with anthropology. Sociology and anthropology don't speak to economics. They all have different languages. This is all because of specialization, 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 and there's no cross-fertilization. Okay, and this is also part of the curse of this totally empirical, relativistic approach in modernity and post-modernity. And our civilization is totally different from that because we are the people who in the first, second, third, and fourth centuries of Islam rooted knowledge. We rooted knowledge. We took all the knowledge of the ancient world, world of India, of China, paper we took from China, and we made it inexpensive. Mathematics we took from the Greeks and from the Persians, from the rabbis, from the Hindus. You know, we took all of this together and we synthesized it. And even when we talked about numbers, we said numbers are not just quantities, they are qualities. Now that's mathematics. That one is not a quantity only, it's also a quality. And that, that geometric figures are not just combinations of angles, they are also personalities. And the square has stability. And the circle has this. And the triangle has that. This is why you get these beautiful mosques, like the Mosque of Sinan you know, in Mecca and in, in, in Turkey. The most, I mean, you have beautiful mosques in Cairo. We have them all over the Muslim world. But Sinan, it's like he is telling you the music of the spheres in triangles and squares and these different colors, because colors have meaning also. This is beautiful. It's beautiful. So this is our science. And also another thing about Islam is that, as you see in this aqidah, it's very simple. It's very basic. We like to do things the simplest way. And in the European tradition, they often do it the most difficult way. I could give you really good examples of that. And a lot of the knowledge that was transmitted from the Muslim world to the West, and almost everything was. Where did Westerners get humanism? Humanism, George Muktasi shows this in The Rise of Humanism. It's a pure academic study, a careful academic study. Humanism comes out of the circle of the Udaba and the Qutab, especially the chancelleries, the, the Qutab who write for the kings and the princes and so forth. This is where humanism comes from, you know, which is the most European, the most Western of all their values. And where did they get the PhD? Where did they get the dissertation? Where did they get freedom of uh, research? They got it from the madrasa. Not the madrasas that you have today where the little kids are sitting there, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and Memra. No, the madrasa that was a university madrasa. That had a waqf with a big library and that produced a faqih and a mujtahid and a mufti. And the PhD degree comes from the authorization of the mufti, faqih, and mujtahid. And he has to have a thesis, and he has to defend it. He has to know ilm al-khilaf, and he has to take a position and defend it. This is the way our madrasas work, and this is what produces the Western University. Again, George Makhdisi, who's a Christian Arab. The Rise of Colleges, these are two great books. The Rise of Colleges and the Rise of Humanism by George Makhdisi. I like George Makhdisi very much. You know, I really do. He was a, I think he was a great man, George Makhdisi. 
you know, and, and uh, you know, so we have a huge influence on the West in all their sciences, their mathematics. You know, Abdullah al-Battani figures out the Copernican theory a long time before Copernicus. The Thabit ibn Qurra works out the basis of calculus long before Newton and before Leibniz. Uh, uh, Newton and, I think Leibniz, right? Who was the other person who did calculus? Wasn't it Leibniz? I think it was. Okay, I mean, really. But usually we did things really simply. We did things really easily. In our architecture, everything. This is the gift of Islam, to keep things easy. Um, you know, look at Al Hamra, for example, in Granada, if you've ever been there. I go to Granada every summer. You know, beautiful place, beautiful place. But Al Hamra is just mud. It is so basic, but it is so majestic. And it's because of the simplicity in it. This is the nature of our culture. And really, this is what you have to do today. We have to revive this tradition. This is what gave us life. This is what gave us these beautiful mosques. This is what gave us the beautiful houses. When the French came to Egypt in the days of Napoleon, who had the superior way of life? The French or the Egyptians? No questions. Egyptians. The Egyptian peasant had a standard of living that was vastly superior to every French soldier. You know, and Cairo was a beautiful city. Cairo was one of the wonders of the world, as was Fez, as was Meknes, as were most Muslim cities. Beautiful cities, spectacular cities, houses. You know, I was in the house of Abdul Aziz al Dubar in Fez. You know, uh, I was a guest of his descendants. And the house, I couldn't believe it, it's so beautiful. An old Moroccan house. And even the, the, the toilet, you know, where you go to the bathroom. I told my son, I said, you have to go, he said, I don't have to go to the bathroom. He said, no, but you, I want you to go to the restroom. I want you to see it. Because it, it was amazing the way they made it. It was totally traditional, you know. I mean, Muslims made beautiful things. Beautiful things and very simple things. In Spain, they made water clocks, and they're very simple in their basic engineering. You know that ability to think simply. E equals m c squared. You know, energy is mass times the speed of light squared. That's simplicity. That simplicity. You know, and we have that gift to do that. And we are the people who root knowledge. You know, uh, whatever the Islamic tradition is. And I believe in the Islamic tradition. But one of the things about the Islamic tradition is that a man or woman who is intelligent, like many of you, and who has a long life, may Allah give us all long lives and good health, and who has adequate leisure, they can master the whole tradition in a lifetime. Everything. And I've seen scholars like that, like Shadali and Nafer of Tunisia. I love Shadali and Nafer. And I visited him for the first time in 1978, 1979. And you know, he was a great scholar. But Tunisian scholars are beautiful. Egyptian scholars are beautiful. But Tunisian scholars are really... And Al-Andalus, Muslim Spain, is the light of Tunisia. You know, Tunisia made Al-Andalus. Al-Andalus made Morocco. Okay. But the Shadi and Nefer, you know, his house was a beautiful Tunisian house. And he had books and manuscripts everywhere. And in my experience with the Shadili and Nefer, he knew everything in his books. I was amazed by him. He knew medicine. He knew geography. He knew history. He knew the Quran. He knew everything. And it's like he even took me into his kitchen. He said, even in the kitchen we have books. And he did. He had all books in the kitchen as well. But it's like Shadri and Nefer is able to master the whole tradition in his lifetime. How? How is that possible? And there, I've known other scholars like that. How? Rooting knowledge. Rooting knowledge. We root the knowledge, just like a book like the Ajurumiya. Very simple text, very blessed, but it roots grammar and syntax. And it enables you to read Siba Way. It enables you to read uh, the, the other great people and to get it all because it puts down the basic principles of these things 
In the modern age, we have to do that. You know, we have got to teach chemistry. We've got to teach physics. We've got to work with quantum, quantum mechanics. We've got to teach sociology and anthropology. And we have to give it a common language and enable and make it something that all of us can master. And we can do, this is our tradition. And what's happening in the West is that it becomes more and more atomized. The more you learn, the less you know. Whereas for us, the more we learn, the more we know. But this is the secret of ta'seen al-ulum, of rooting knowledge. And that's the great, one of the greatest secrets of Islamic civilization. And of course it begins with theology. This is the rooting of knowledge. What is the foundation of reality? And again, this basic theology, which is the first ob obligation, the first wajib, it's just the foundation. On it you build a palace. And that palace has in it physics and metaphysics, has in it chemistry, it has in it history, real history. And again, if we open that door, we won't even go home tonight, because that's what I really love, is history. You know, the history of the world is your history. What we did, humanism, universities, the PhD, the professor's chair, all of that, you know, and Muslims, you cannot understand the history of Europe, not Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, Northern Europe, not even the Vikings, if you don't know what we were doing. You know, I mean, so we've got a lot to do, and, and you are a beautiful generation. You know, you are a beautiful generation. And I know that what's happening in Egypt is really heart-rending because it's so difficult, it's so difficult. But I really hope and pray that the Egyptian people will be victorious, because you are good people, and you have deep traditions, and you have so much to offer. And I just hope and pray that again we see this civilization grow again in Syria, in Libya, in Tunisia, in all the Muslim world, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. اللهم وفقنا لما تحبه وترضى واجعلنا من عبيدك السعداء وأمتنا على كلمة الهدى علمنا ما ينفعنا ووفقنا للعمل بما علمتنا به واجعل ما نحن فيه خالصا مخلصا لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمع مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما آمين 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 يا رب العالمين We have two more nights <laughs> إن شاء الله